Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. We demonstrate now let's look at verse 2 because Paul's gonna go on and they had some they had some problems in Corinth in the church they had written to him about them, and Paul's got to now address these things that that they were asking about so 1st Corinthians 11 verse 2 he says now he says I praise you because you remember me in everything and you hold firmly to the traditions as I delivered them to you I, I give you a good pat on the back you remember the traditions and you're holding on to them, good job. He says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. How many of you know this? Christ is supposed to be the head. Not, <laughs> I know some guys are like, I want to be the boss <laughs> over God. <laughs> Sorry, guys, it does not work that way. I mean, look, straight away, if you got that problem, you got a big problem. Okay? When Paul says, but I have to tell you this, Pay attention. Whenever, uh, whenever someone starts with but, in the, you know, I got to tell you some but. Usually there's some hook here, you know, there's some, some important thing they're going to say. But I got to tell you, Christ is what? He's not the foot of every man, he's the head. He's the one in charge. The head gives the command to the rest. We're called the body of Christ, right? Who, if, if we're the body, we're not the head. Christ is the head. Who's in charge of making the body move? The head. Now, this might sound so simplistic. Some of you are going, gee, this is simple anatomy. Everyone knows the head's in charge. Again, sometimes, you know, we do stuff that's not really along those lines. We, we try to get one body part in charge over the head. Or one body part that doesn't want to listen to the head. You ever seen that happen? No, we wouldn't admit we would ever be that part. Some other part. Some other Christians did that. Not us. We always submit to the head. We're, we're in sync. I submit to you the only time I've ever gotten in trouble is when I don't submit to the head. If you can receive that, that's probably all you need to learn from the lesson today. The, the, the warning is be careful whenever you won't submit to Christ as your head. Because Christ is, you know, Aaron shared with me this morning, Christ sometimes to some people, he's just their savior. He's like a life preserver. Like, you know, you're in the ocean drowning. They're like, Seth, throw me a life preserver, I'm drowning. And they, and they look at Jesus as that life ring, you know, they can hang on to, and he's going to save me. He's their get out of hell free card. He Save me from eternal damnation, Lord, I'll take it. I need saving. And they, and they sign up for that, but they don't understand that the Bible teaches he's not just our savior. He's called our Lord and Savior. Now, what does the word Lord mean? Some of you know this word. It means master. Master, you know, like the one in charge, master. And when he's the master, well, who calls the shots? It's supposed to be him. Unfortunately, some of the Christians, they only want him as Savior and not as Lord. They don't want him to be calling the shots. They don't want him as a man. You can save me, but don't tell me what to do. Is that really a true imitator? Like Paul's talking about being an imitator of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. Is that really becoming an imitator of Christ? No. You're falling off the, the you're missing the boat. Paul will be like, excuse me. Did I just, I was there a year and a half. I told you guys. Remember the traditions? What kind of traditions do you think he was teaching them? He taught them about the Lord's Supper. He taught them to follow the Lord. He taught them to imitate the Lord. And now he says, you did a good job, but you need to remember something. And uh, By the way, do you think we could preach this message to all the churches around the world that Christ is the head? Like that we're supposed to remember who's in charge? Because sometimes I've... I've I've been around a little while, at least 35 plus years in Christ, and I've seen different expressions of the body of Christ, different fellowships. It's amazing how some churches, you go in and you're like, they don't ever talk about Christ being in charge. They talk about the leadership being in charge, or, or the, the denomination is in charge. 
But that's not what the Bible teaches us, is the head. There's only one head, that's Jesus. And if you don't want to recognize that, you probably won't like the rest of the sermon. I'm just telling you, like, honestly, you won't get that much. But if you can, if you can, how many can get, okay, I can go with this. He's the head. Raise your hand. I just want to see if we got uh, agreement here. Christ is the head, not us. Okay, let's let him do his job. He calls the shots. He's the boss, okay? Because you'll do a lot better. Trust me on this. Paul, would they do better if they make Christ the head? Anyone give an amen to that? Amen. amen. Okay, so let's go on and see now Paul saying, he wrote me some questions. Now, remember, they had questions about relationships with marriage, with um, the non-Christians. How do they deal with them? Now he, he's going to turn to the, I think, one of the most important relationships is the relationship of a husband and a wife. Remember when Paul wrote to the church at, at, at Ephesus? He said, marriage is a great mystery. And it represents what? What does the mystery it represented? It was a showing of the mystery of Christ and his church. Marriage. Marriage is like the living. Some people are never going to read a Bible, but they're going to watch your marriage. They're looking at you. You're a living Bible for them. You're, you're the only Bible they'll ever read. And if you don't realize that those of you that are married, guys, I'm going to take you to Ephesians in a few minutes. We don't really get off easy. We, we, we have specific instructions about how we're supposed to love our wives. Like Christ did what? Love the church. That's what, we're, and by the way, it's not a suggestion. So don't, don't think you get out of this, guys. You, if you feel like it, you get to love your wife like Christ loves the church. No, you, you are, it's a command. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he laid down his life. He gave his life for her. And he sanctified her. And he washed her clean by the washing of the water of the word. He, 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 he like made her cleansed so that he could take his bride and say, here she is. No spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. For the guys that are not married yet, listen to me, guys. If you meet a gal and you are sitting there picking her apart and you're thinking, oh, she's got this flaw and that flaw and that and this and that, and you're not willing to present her, you know, when it's the right gal, let me just tell you, when it's the right gal, what you're supposed to do is say, look at my sweetheart. Isn't she perfect? Mine's back there, yeah. That one is perfect for me. The rest of you get your hands off. I'm really Sicilian. I will break your arm. No. No, the reality is that, that we're supposed to sanctify, set her on a pillar higher than any other person. And by the way, there's no, I said this before, but there's no putting mom on the same shelf. I love you, honey, but I will never stop loving my mom as much as I love you. Does that work out well for the guy? Nope. Nope. That's the worst thing you can do. The word sanctify means to put on the, the highest shelf. It's a word from the Greek culture where they had that pillar of sanctification. When you came into the foyer of the real rich person's house, they had those, those carved pillars in the, in the foyer. And in the center, one pillar stood. Ornate thing, like at the height of a man's head, usually about six foot high. And it's just in the middle of the foyer doing nothing. Except it was called the pillar of sanctification because in their culture, the Greek culture, they were polytheistic. They had many gods. And they got Zeus and Hermes and Aphrodite. And whatever god you had as the owner of the home, when you were the lord of your house, the master of your house, you got to choose which god was your favorite. And you could only have one. One statue that you put Usually it was a, a bust, you know, like the, from the, the waistline up, you know, the carving. They would have that sitting right there. So when you walked into the person's house, you'd be like, oh, this guy's into Zeus. You knew right away, whatever his God, his preferred, he could still believe in other ones, but his, the one that in his mind was the greatest, the best, no one better sat on that pillar. Paul used the very same word that the Greeks used for sanctification for their God to tell us men we have to sanctify our wives. He didn't use a different word. In the Greek, he used the same word that says, you must put your God on this high pillar. No other one gets to share the shelf. You put your wife on that pillar. And if you, by the way, if you're a mama's boy and you put mama next to that, you're just, you're just asking for trouble. 
That pillar is meant for one only. Okay, Gals, do you like it when you know you're the one? You're his one. That's it. One. No other. She's my one. When the girl, how does it make you feel, by the way, when you, when you know you're, you're the one that he sanctifies top shelf? You're, that's it. You, the, no one else touches it. No one's even close. That's what sanctify means. Now, unfortunately, this is a teaching of the Bible that we learn because of what Christ did for the church. Until Christ came, women were, I, I, honestly, if you study history, how women were treated, especially over in, in that region of the world, women were treated as property and not very well. Not very well. It was Christ that elevated the position of women when he came and taught these teachings and then Paul takes that teaching and says, all right, guys, no getting out of this. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. You got to do this. You got to do it. It's the way it goes. And for the gals, well, you know, let me just do this part first. I, I want you to tell me how many instructions the gals have. And I'll come back to Corinthians to tie it all together for you. Turn to Ephesians 5. This is where we get the wedding vows from. For the, you know, people are like, where do we get that, you know, love, cherish, till death do us part thing? You know, where's that? that that's in the Bible, okay? Just so you know. So you're like, uh, traditional vows, where, where do they come from? The Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, he, he, he gave those instructions. Now, he, get, he does... For you guys that know this, he, um, this is in the last part of Ephesians. He says in verse 23, The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of what? The church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. And husbands... You have to love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. Sanctify means set her apart on that pillar, that special place, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. You know when Christ presents us someday? Is he going to present us with all our flaws? Look at my bride. She's all messed up. <laughs> no. We're going to be presented to the world without spot, without wrinkle, or any such, no blemish. The Christ will have made us presented as, here they are, my perfect bride. Now, why will we be perfect? Because of us? No, no because of what he did. His work makes us perfect. By the way, guys, with your brides, you're supposed to be presenting them. This is my bride. She's perfect. Some of you fall really short on this. You, you go telling other people, oh, but my wife, she did this wrong and she did that wrong. She burnt the toast and she popped my yolk when she was cooking it. And I hate it when the yolks get popped. I don't need to hear this. That doesn't matter. You're supposed to present your bride without spot, without wrinkle or any such thing. She's perfect. I share this because my grandfather, we, we, you know, being raised in a Sicilian household, we only spoke Sicilian at home. We, we spoke, a, it's, a, it's a slang of Italian. It's not really true Italian. I had to go to college to learn true Italian. But when company would come over, my grandfather would try to speak in English a little bit. My grandmother's a little bit better at it. And basically, I got the job of taking over. That was just, you know, when you're the kid that can go to school and learn English and Italian, then you come home, and someone from across the street comes over, and they don't speak any Italian. You have to step in. And so this one older fellow was joking with my grandfather about his wife did something. She burnt the toast or something, and, and what a horrible way to start the day. And your wife probably does the same thing. And, you know, he's like trying to strike up a conversation with my grandfather. And I saw a look that has stuck with me for the rest of my life. My grandfather looked at that fella when he said, and your wife probably does the same stuff. He looked at her like drop dead. Like I would tell you anything that my wife ever did wrong. 
Not in a not it not in a million years of torture will I ever. That's not your business. Just that look, and it was a look. <laughs> he didn't say a word because he just looked at him like you got to be kidding me. I'm not even going into this conversation. And you know, if you don't know this look from a good Italian Sicilian, it, it was a it was so powerful. And the silence. Have you ever had it where silence is speaks louder than any words? I mean, the silence that my grandfather gave that guy when he was laughing about his wife's mistakes and wanted my grandfather, my grandfather wouldn't even join in to laugh about the other guy's wife's mistake. He didn't find it humorful. He found it very distasteful that you would even be talking like that about your own bride. And then to want him to join you in doing, now, do we have sitcoms where they do that? All over the TV. So disrespectful to women. I mean, it's horrible. It just beats people down. And that's, guys, that's not what we're called to do. We are commanded to love our wives like Christ loved the church. And he presents her with no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. He says, this is my bride. Isn't she perfect? I made her perfect. Gals, how do you feel when your husband presents you that way? Is that a good feel? How, how do we feel as the church, the body of Christ, when we know that he's going to present us that way? I don't know about you, but I feel great. Because I know I'm not perfect. But I know it's Christ's blood that washes away my imperfections. And it didn't come to cover my sin. It came to remove my sin. That's a cleansing that is so deep, it, it, it refreshes my soul. And guys, you have the power to refresh your wife's soul. But listen, after I looked at my grandfather's eyes and saw him give the stare of death to that guy, I looked behind him and I saw my grandmother's eyes. Do you know how she looked? She was carrying over some hot bread she had just made for my grandfather. She reached around, put it in front of him with a smile on her face. No, no, not, she didn't look, at, you know, she's looking at him, giving him the fresh bread, and I'm like, He knew what he was doing. See, but that, that is, some people say, well, that's old school manners. No, that's really old school. That's from the Bible day manners. That's what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian from the beginning. Christians should be masters of this. We should be so good at doing this, men, that the people who never read a Bible see us treat our wives and go, there's something different about that guy. There's something beautiful. Look at how he loves his wife. Look how he just... I mean, he presents her to everyone like, look at how perfect she is. And, and, you know, they should be able to see a picture, a living picture of Christ and, the, and his bride in our marriages. Now, I forgot to tell you, there's a few more things we have to do, guys. <laughs> we don't get off easy here. He says, we should present her, verse 27, back to Ephesians 5, that we present her with no spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing that she should be what? Holy and blameless. How does it make us feel when Christ makes us holy and blameless? Isn't that a great feeling? He has set us apart for a, a special holy means separated, consecrated use. And blameless means we there's nothing we can be pinned on us, no, no fault, no sin. He has forgiven it. How does that make you feel when you know Christ makes you holy and blameless? Isn't that a great feeling? That he's forgiven you that completely? But guys, that's how we have to present our wives. To the world, we ought to present them holy and blameless. And then it says, So husbands also ought to love their wives as their own... Oh boy, here we go. Some of you guys are not going to like this. As your own what? Your own body. See, it says no one's ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it. We take care of our own, don't we take care of our own body real well? We don't even need instructions. D did you ever have to have someone say, you need instructions on taking care of your own body? We, we kind of like gravitate to those things. We figure them out right away. Like no instruction, even prompting necessary. We just 
We crave to find out how to take care of our own, how to nourish and cherish this thing. I'll take care of that. But see, the Bible says when you're married, the two become what? One flesh. You're no longer two, you're one. So now you're talking, your flesh is her flesh, her flesh is yours. You need to take care of her flesh, nourish and cherish her flesh because it's part of yours. In God's economy, you two became one. And what's it say? What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. No man separate. God puts you together. You're together. Now, guys, we don't get... This isn't a suggestion. Does it say anywhere here? If you feel like it, you might want to sanctify her once in a while. Maybe nurse and cherish her a little just to keep her alive. No! This is something you're supposed to do all the time. How much do you like Christ to nourish and cherish you? All the, I mean, I like it all the time. So guys, we have to do this all the time. Now, all this instruction for us guys, and it says, and by the way, if you just want to know the rest of the marriage vows, no one ever hated his own flesh. He nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and he shall what? Be joined to, cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, Paul says in verse 32, is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and his church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And wives, see to it that you respect your husband. Now this is one of the things that I was sure there was a typo here. Because only thing I can figure out in this whole chapter women get told to do, I can't even find the verse that says they have to love their husband. It just says submit to them. Be, respect them. This doesn't say love anywhere. We have to love them, lay our lives down, sanctify, nourish, cherish, no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such thing. And they got to do respect? What? Where's the verse that says they got to love us and nourish and cherish us and do all that other stuff? By the way, is it in there? Those of you that know the scripture, is there a verse that says that? In the whole of the Bible, there is not. Now, at first I was convinced God made a boo-boo here. But after many years of pastoring and having to hear lots of marital strivings and complaints, I realized we are wired a whole lot different. You know that menace Mars thing, women, Venus, all that stuff? You know, different planets, different whole things going on. Yep, that's right. And it's scriptural. Women need a lot more things in line to, be t to know they're loved. And that includes nourishing, cherishing. It, guys, you, sorry, this is the way they're wired. They are more complex than us. We have like a simple button. If we don't feel any respect, guess what? We don't feel loved. In fact, there's a, a comedian, a worldly comedian, made his whole claim to fame on one line. I don't get no respect. He used to close every single one of his, his acts with, I don't get no, who was it? Rodney Dangerfield, that's right. Why, how can you build an audience, a following, in the comedic world if you don't have people that can identify with your humor? The only, way, the only, the only way humor is really, truly funny is if you can personally, you know, feel some connection. He's got millions of followers. He's not that good looking. And all he says really is one line. It's that one line that built his whole entire claim to fame. And the reason is because there's a lot of men that don't feel respected. Now, this does not tell you women that you have to respect all men. What men are you supposed to respect in this passage? Your husband. Just your husband. But let me tell you, from the flip side, from the man's point of view, you can tell us all day, you love us, you nourish us, you cherish us, you do all those wonderful things for us, and you say, but I don't respect you. You know what you just said to us? You hate us. You do not love us. We don't, our filter is way more simple. I know that some people get mad at me for saying, this is just the truth. This is rubber meets the road. You do marriage counseling as long as I have, you will find out this is really true. And women will tell me, but he's not worthy to be respected. He's a foul up. 
I didn't find a verse that says when he's worthy, you get to respect him. It just says you got to do it. Just like we have to sanctify you. It doesn't say when you deserve it. You're our bride, we got to do it. Where your husband, you got to do it. Now, some of you are going to say, that's too simple. But have you tried it? See, I watched this play out in a real relationship very close to me. My own brother, Joseph, he's in heaven now. But when he was young, he was a dreamer. And he had, man, he, he was he's brilliant. He was a very creative thinker, though. He could think of all sorts of ideas of, you know, man, we should, we should make this and modify that, or we could do this and make this better, or we could, and all these wonderful, I mean, he could start like 50 businesses in a, in a day, in his mind. I mean, he literally, but then he would go and start at least a dozen during the week. I'm going to make a screen printing uh, thing. Well, come help me. Let's build a four screen printing press, and then the, we'll make our own t-shirts, and then we'll start this business. Oh, since we've got the t-shirt press, let's start this business. We'll make a pressure washing business. And, let's go to, and he would do all these things, man. He just like, endless. And he seemed to really not have really that, that ability to, how do you call it, um, stick with something? Yeah, he was all over the place. And he didn't really have a gal in his life that, that was the right one. He dated different girls, and He'd be with one one week, and then next week, oh, it's a different one, and just couldn't find the right one. And one, you know, like, I think it was like in Thanksgiving time, he came home with one girl, Jody, and then Christmas time, he came home with the one named Joni. <laughs> and uh, just one letter difference, completely different gal, though. Joni, when she heard his ideas, she said to him, I respect that you can do that. I, I know you can. I believe in you. Just literally, just, just, that's so cool that you can think like that. I know you can do it. You know what happened? All of a sudden, he launched a business. Business exploded. And, and literally, that part of him that couldn't seem to stay on track was, was, I mean, could persevere and just fire straight down the line. And he, he made it explode. And you go, What's, what, what was the difference? You know how they say behind every good man there's what? A great woman. A great woman. Now, guys, don't get mad at me because the Bible teaches this from the very beginning. When Adam gets created by God in the garden and God says, presents all the animals to Adam. Adam names them all and God goes, there was not a helpmate suitable for him. So he put Adam to sleep and he took a rib and he formed woman. From, from Hebrew, woman is, means taken from man. She wasn't taken from his heel. Like some guys want to put their wives under their feet. That's not right. She was taken from where? The rib. What does the rib protect? The heart. God goes, I'll take her from that part and I'll form the perfect helpmate for him. And he made Eve. And he presented Eve to Adam, and Adam went, she shall be called woman. She was taken from me. And she's, she's now his bride. Now, when God did that, this is the part people don't want me to tell, because it said Adam wasn't good for him to be alone. He needed a help mate suitable for him. What does that imply men need? Help. Girls, help out here. Help. help. I get in trouble every time I teach this. Not by the girls. The girls are already going, amen, pastor, preach it. Yeah, you're right. They need help. It's the guys who are too prideful to say, are there men like that that say, I don't need any help? I don't need help. I don't need anybody help. I'll do it all on my own. Good luck. You know, the longer you live, you realize that's a stupid philosophy. As a man, do we do well when we just say, no, I don't need anybody. That's baloney. What? But implied by God's design, we need help. So he made a helpmate suitable. Now, if you say to your wife, don't help me, the very thing she was, cre the purpose for her creation was to help you, and you say, don't do it. How fulfilled will her life be? You just stepped all over. Her, her, her design by God is to help you. But you're too proud. 
to accept it. And I ain't accepting her help. I'll get help somewhere else. That's stupid. God made her so she can help you. Accept the help. For those of you who don't know this, I'm colorblind. I can see one color. It's called monochronomic. It's a, it, just one color, blue. It's my favorite color. See, there's a lot of blue out there. A little hazy today, but it's all right. I still like it. Do you know how good that is for having to get up in front of you and preach and have to get the clothes to match? Now, today, I know I did good because I got the blue clothes out myself. I did this last night by myself. I checked with my wife before I put it in the car, though, because I have by accident put something that doesn't go together. I'll go out. Is this okay, honey? No. Back. That's my wife. It's true, huh, honey? If I was too proud to accept her help, you guys would probably think I am a fashion crasher or something. I mean, you'd be like, that dude does not know how to put a pair of pants with a, with a shirt, you know? He is a moron. The truth is, you'll never know that about me unless I tell you because she always looks after me. And I let her and I, ex I willingly accept her help, wanting her help, because I know she's looking out for me. Now, is that bad as a man to admit that you're willing to accept the help? No. It's when we're so prideful that we don't do that, we get in trouble. Okay? And this is, this is something. And, gals, you, <laughs> I told you last week I would teach you a secret that I learned from my Nona. This is the one secret I promised I have to put this in here. It's a very delicate thing when you're helping a man because we don't really like to be told sometimes that we need help. Even though we do need the help, okay? I'm not saying we don't. It's just how you tell us that we need the help when we're messing up. That you have to, this is the secret I'm going to teach you. I watched my Nona, 63 years she was married to my grandfather. They never once did my grandmother tell my grandfather what to do. Not once. Now, did she ever speak into his life good suggestions of what he needs to do because he might not see the answer? But she can. She stepped back over here and she sees it clear as day because she got the you know a little bit bigger perspective. It's like I see the answer. Do you think she would walk over and say, "Oh, I see what you need to do," and tell him? No. Because that's not respectful. But she did teach me by example a respectful way to do this. Something that, by the way, I want all of you gals that, that at a maturity level where you're old enough to set this example for the next generation, please help me do this. Because this is a lost art. I mean, this is truly lost. My grandmother would never tell my grandfather the answer. You know what she would do? She'd go up and ask it in the form of a question. Honey, would it work if you did this? You know, I, I see you're struggling with it. I don't know, but would this work? And what she was doing is spoon-feeding him the answer, but she wasn't <laughs> telling him, you idiot, you don't know the answer, let me tell you. She was respectfully being a helper. Do we mind getting help? No. Now, there was an occasion when she suggested something, thinks she had the answer, and he answered, thank you, sweetie, I thought of that, but that, that wouldn't really work. And then he explained why it wouldn't work. And she didn't see something that he did see. But see, if she would have said, you idiot, you're just doing it wrong, do this, then he would have turned and said, you're the idiot because you don't understand this, you know. And then it would have done exactly what you've seen it do on the sitcoms. <laughs> but just by asking in the form of a question leaves room for the form of an answer. <laughs> or even the form of, thank you, I need it. That's a great suggestion. See, it works a lot better. She never told him. She just asked. How about, remember, marriage is about what mystery? Christ and the church. How about us talking to the head? Do we say, hey, you need to do this down here. I see a problem. You ought to take care of that head. You know, you're the husband in the relationship. You should fix that. Or should we go to the Lord and say, Lord, could you fix that? Or is there some, you know, because maybe you don't see the bigger picture and he does. Sometimes we're even bossy with God. Have you ever noticed that? Some folks, they really, like, I listen to their prayers and I'm like, do you think God just doesn't 
know his job? I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I'm pretty sure he's more equipped than we are. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> but, but if I listen to your prayers, you're like, God, you need to do this and this, and I'm telling you, get this done and fix that. And then when you get that done, that domino will fall, and then this will fall, and then you can do that. And, then, you know, like they got it all figured out for God. The whole plan of how God can, God, if you want, if you want me to have that place, you could just let me win this thing, and I could enter that drawing, and then I could win that drawing, and you can make this happen, and then I'll be a multi-billionaire, and then I'll buy the thing, and oh, by the way, I'll tithe. God's going, I'm really impressed by your plan. I was just going to have someone give it to you, but, you know, <laughs> you like got 50 steps to get to that. and We do this to God. But who's the head? Christ. Now, for you gals, go back to, let's go back to Corinthians. He said, Paul, when he's writing the church at Corinth, every man, he says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. This is, this is who's in charge. We need to remember this. The rest of the instruction will not make sense to you unless you learn the chain of command. Who's at the top? God. Who's under him? Christ. Who's under him? Then the man. Then who's under him? The woman. Did I make this? Is this, is he, to, I'm telling you, this is, no, I didn't. If you don't like this, don't get mad at me, okay? I, I don't need hate mail. You, you, you leave your comments below in the description. You know, on the YouTubers, they'll be like, I don't like this. Christ is the head. I want to be the head. Okay, look. And then may, I'm just telling you the way it is. And women, make sure you know, this is the... Now, guys, if you're loving your wives like Christ loves the church, it's a lot easier for her to respect you as her head. If, what if the guy is not loving the wife like Christ loves the church? Is it really healthy for the woman to submit to that? So some guys are abusive. They use this, they use this as an authority. Have you ever run into guys that misabuse this authority? It, it, I, I'm like, dude, you, they're like, tell my wife to submit to me. I had this one guy commanding me. I, mean, I command you to tell my wife, I'm going to give this money to the church, and now you go over and command my wife to submit to me. You're the pastor of this church. You need to do something. And he's waving his check around. I said, you can go. I don't care how much money you give. You don't tell me to go tell your wife to do something. First of all, you're not, you're not sanctifying your own wife. Why would she want to respect you? You're a bully. You're a jerk. I mean, the guy was a jerk. We had to actually, you know, a very few times have I ever had to ask someone to leave the church. This guy, first we, we went to him in private, didn't work. Brought along some others, didn't work. Said, you want to come next week? I'm going to put you up in front of the church and tell everybody you're a bully. You don't take care of your wife. You don't sanctify her and you are a bully to the other people in the church. He wanted all the women in the church to bow to him. <laughs> Starting with his wife, and then on down the road, I was like, the only problem is he's about this big. He was a big dude. And I was a lot smaller back then, and I was like, Lord, this is David and Goliath here. You better give me some <laughs> help. Give me a rock or something, man. This guy, he's out of line. And I literally, I remember him just ranting. He came to the front of our house and started ranting on the side. And I had to call Wally Don. Wally, come with me. Let's go talk to him. And we had to say, you're out of here. Don't even come back. So you learn to submit to Christ as your head. You want everyone else to be submitted to you, but you don't submit to Christ. And it doesn't work, guys. You, you're not going to love your wife the correct way if you won't submit to the Lord. This is a chain of command, you know. Christ submitted to God. Jesus himself, even in stuff he didn't want. Remember when he was going to the cross, he said, Father, I don't want to drink this cup. Right? If it could pass, if there's any way I could pass on this, let's just, you know, pass, because he knew what was coming. But what did he do? Nevertheless, he didn't say, my will, thy will be done. He showed us submission to the chain of command, the, the one who's in authority. God. Now, I'm to imitate him, right? Paul says, you imitate me as I imitate him, and he's, he's showing me what to do. Submit to God. Men, we cannot tell our wives, submit to us, if we don't submit to God. 
It would, be, it would be imbalanced. It would be improper. You need to be submitted to Christ first. She won't have a problem submitting to you when you're submitted to Christ. Trust me, this works really good. As long as you learn the chain. Break one link in the chain, you muck up the whole thing. It doesn't work. It just ruins, it abuses is what it does. Instead of beautifies like it's meant to. See, it's a beautiful thing when a man submits to Christ and his wife submits to him as he's submitting to the Lord. It, it, it's a, like a living picture. Isn't it? It's gorgeous. I mean, it is so neat to see couples that actually live this out. You're just like, wow. There's something different there. That's, and to the world, do they spot that? Are they watching us? That's a question. You know, do, do the people who don't go to church, do they watch us as Christians? Isn't it funny how they'll be like, aren't you a Christian? Are you supposed to be doing that? You're like, wait, I've never seen you at church. Doesn't matter. I don't think you're supposed to. I don't think Jesus would do that. Is that funny? How they know what Jesus would do? No, no, Jesus wouldn't do that. Aren't you supposed to be imitating Jesus? You know, come on. If the non-Christians know we're supposed to act like that, then why don't we know that we're supposed to act like that? Let's live up to being a Christian the way the Bible teaches us and do it right. Now, I'm not going to go to the next part because it's about praying and prophesying with your head covered, you know, or uncovered for, for the guys. You're not supposed to have a covering because we're the image of God. It's a picture. Next week, I'll go into more details about it. It's a cultural thing. Some people say it's not cultural. I'm not here to argue. I'll, just t I'll teach you what it says, and you can use it as the Lord leads you. And, and just remember, who's the head? Okay, it, it, the rest of the instruction, without, without the perspective of who's the true head, it's just a fight waiting to happen. I have seen more fights over stupid stuff. How many of you have seen Christians fight over a verse, a passage of Scripture? Well, I say it means this. I say it means that. And you're like, does either of you care about what does God show? You know, like, what is the Spirit of God showing you? Are you living it? Because I know He showed me. I better, I better sanctify my bride. If I want a, if I want a chance of this to work the right way. I, it's not, this is not optional for me. And I hope that if you ever see me mess up on that, I'm quick to repent. Because that's not my style. I want to be, I want to be even better than my grandfather was at it. That's my, <laughs> I mean, he was my living example of someone who actually did it. Now, I know that's old school. Some of you need some old school, though. Really. Can, can anyone remember a day when that was the norm that men treated women like that? That's how we we're supposed to treat them? Listen, I, I think it's become a great disservice that we've gotten away from what the Bible teaches. We, 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 we're not even taught the, I call it the manners of our Christianity. Like this is manners 101. This is, this is, this is husband-wife manners, but we got to do the manners. When, when you have people that don't have good manners, are they fun to be around? No. Some of you Christians are getting me a little agitated. You're not fun to be around because you don't keep up the manners. And then you wonder why, you know, oh, nobody wants to go hang out with you. You've got bad manners in your very relationship with your spouse. Use good manners with your spouse. Well, the, the most important relationship you have on this earth besides your relationship to God, right? is your relationship to your spouse. That's the picture of Christ in the church to the world. Do that one with the best manners you can. Foul up with the, some other relationship, not that one. Okay? That's the one that counts. Let's do that one good. And if we do, you know, it, it really does come back to bless us. That, that's how complete... God gives good instruction for our good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this chance to visit this portion of scripture i just pray the part what we visited lord you would help us to to internalize and to live lord for you we want we acknowledge you father as the head over everything and your son acknowledges you're his head and 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 he's our head as the church lord i pray for every man here that we would be man up and we would be men that that truly walk imitating your son so that the women can have good examples of men that love them the way they ought to. 
Help us, Lord, in these days. Help us not to, to fall into the, to the ways that our culture is, is veering and, t and, and going away from you, Lord. Just let us stay steadfast in our resolve to follow you. I ask that in Jesus, your son's precious name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.